morning, everyone. So a little old lady seated herself right beside the bus driver, right behind the bus driver. And every 10 minutes or so, she'd pipe up, have we reached Oriskany Falls yet, Sonny? And the bus driver said, no lady, not yet, I'll let you know. And time after time, she would ask, Mr. Driver, have we reached Oriskany Falls yet? And he would say, no, no. And then the hours passed and the old woman kept asking for Oriskany Falls. And finally, the little town came into view. Sighing with relief, the driver slammed on the brakes, pulled over and called out, lady, this is where you get out. Is this Oriskany Falls, says the lady? Yes, now get out. Oh, I'm going all the way to Albany, Sonny. It's just that my daughter told me when we get to Oriskany Falls, I should take my blood pressure pills. Okay, so the question is, how do we know when we get there and where are we headed? And this is really a perennial question that all of us ask and all of us wanna know. What is the, um, what is the end of the journey? And truth to be told is that the reason that we ask, are we there yet? The reason that we continually ask, are we there yet, is because knowing where we're headed gives us context to where we are. We spend most of our life preparing to go somewhere or working toward some, working toward some end. And the way in which we perceive the end gives us sense of scale and a sense of value and purpose to where we are. Yeah. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the way we think about how far, how long, and what the nature of the end of the journey will be very much determines the way in which we uh, the way in which we experience the journey itself. As a matter of fact, when a person uh, sets out on um, sets out on a journey, uh, when they begin that that trek, uh, they may feel anticipation. They may, uh, you know, uh, feel worry. But uh, when uh, based on when, when we get close to the end, um, we have a sense that um, we have a a um, we have a, a a feeling of excitement and enthusiasm, and that all is determined by what our perspective or perception of the nature of the end is. Maybe accomplishment and achievement as well. Matter of fact, a friend of mine recently ran the New York City Marathon. And, um, and he said, uh, and he told me the, he sent me a text afterwards saying the following. He said, running a marathon is like driving to Florida. You drive through the night and you have 14 hours left and you're so tired. He said, there was a funny sign at the eight mile marker that read, you're not even close to the end. <laughs> and so the truth is, is that, um, that this is uh, a profound question that also is an existential one it's not only a, a, a it's not only a question of our uh of the things that we have to do it's also a question about the meaning of life itself and for the jewish people for people in general we may ask the question where are we headed what is the meaning of all of this what are we working towards and the nature of that, the, the nature of the answer to that, to that question determines very much uh, how we how we relate to uh, to how we experience what we're doing here as people, as Jewish people, as servants of God. If we um, and this is really the the uh, the issue that. Uh, in this week's Parsha uh, is really touched on in a very powerful way. Um, in the very beginning of the Parsha, 
uh, we get the news that Jacob, our ancestor Jacob, Israel, Yisrael, is very is deathly ill, and he's reaching the end of his life. And um, if we turn to uh, well, we're learning Parshas Vayechi, it's uh, Genesis uh, at the end, it begins Genesis at the end of chapter forty-seven, verse twenty-eight. But we're going to go ahead to uh, chapter forty-nine, Parak Mem Tess, page one eighty-three. And Yaakov called unto his sons, and he said, "Gather yourselves together, and I will tell you that which will happen to you." At the end of days. Wow. And then he says, Join to uh, assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Yaakov, and hear Israel your father. And he goes on to bless each of his children. And we well, we, we refer to these words as the blessing of Yaakov. Uh, he blesses each of his 12 children each of his 12 sons. And if we read, uh, indeed, the Torah refers to it as a blessing. Page uh, 187, verse 28. All the, this is the last verse on the page. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is that their father spoke unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. Uh, a, a number of things to note in this in this verse is that at the beginning of the at the beginning of the verse at the beginning of the blessings they are called the sons of Yaakov. At the end of the blessings they are called Shivtei Yisrael, the tribes right. of Israel. They have gone they have gone from being individual people to being heads of tribes. And thus, the family of the children of Israel becomes the nation of Am Yisrael. And it is in this moment, this is the pivotal moment in which we become Shivtei Yisrael, the tribes of Israel, elevated from B'nai Yaakov, the sons of Yaakov. Let's look at this quote-unquote blessing. We go back to page 183, verse 2. Assemble and listen, sons of Yaakov, hear Yisrael, your father. Ruvain, you are my firstborn. You are my strength, my firstborn of my strength. The excellence of dignity, the excellence of power. <laughs> you are unstable as water. You have not the excellency because you went up to your father's bed. You defiled it. He went up to my couch. This refers to a, a moment of indiscretion that Ruvain engaged in, and he refers to him as unstable. Shimon and Levi are brethren. Weapons of violence is their kinship. Let my soul not come into their counsel, unto their assembly. Let my glory not be united. For in their anger they slew men, and in their self-will they hoffed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So this doesn't sound like blessings, does it? Um, one interpretation looks at those words at the end. At the end of the blessings. Ish asher kevir Each person, according to his blessing, he blessed him. Which is to say, a blessing, there is... There is a profoundly meaningful blessing in being told your truth. It isn't a, a meaningless compliment is, is like drugs, it's candy. It's complete, it makes you feel good for a minute, but it's ultimately useless. And a word of truth, even if it's painful, even if it hurts in the moment, if it's something that's really true about you, then you can use it to determine, uh, you can use it to, uh, to find your course, to find your way. And so 
even though these words are harsh, if they are true, if they cut to the core of what you need to correct, then it's a blessing. And it determines your path in life. This is the path you need to take. This is the, the, um, this is the way you need to follow in order to go where you go, in order to be who you're meant to be. And so Yaakov gives his sons the blessing, this interpretation says, Yaakov gives his sons the blessings of not coddling them. And then finally, he moves on to Yehuda. Um, you shall your brethren praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. The scepter, I skip to verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff come between his feet, etc. Then Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. And Yisachar is a uh, strong donkey. And uh, Dun is a serpent. And he goes on to describe each, if you read them, he doesn't bless them, he describes them. And this is why some of them need harsh descriptions. Some of them are just descriptions. Because it's, uh, it's a blessing to know who you are and what you're meant for. So this is one interpretation. Another interpretation says, this is the interpretation of a Barbanel. He says, actually, um, we have to take into account the opening. Opening of these, of this, uh, of these words to the sons of Israel, ultimately to the people, to Am Yisrael, is gather and I will tell you that which will happen to you at the end of days. So you might read that simply, this is, these are your next steps. But our tradition says, a Midrashic tradition says, that what Yaakov was actually saying is, let me tell you what will ultimately, what is the end of the ride for you and for the world? Where are we headed? When will you have arrived? What is the day in which we can say the world and the Jewish people have reached their ultimate purpose and perfection? We call that in our tradition, the coming of Mashiach. Coming of Mashiach means the messianic age. That is when, uh, the, Jew when the world and the Jewish people have reached their complete maturity, have reached their ultimate um, have reached their ultimate um, actualization when we have uh, when we've when we've when we've reached our purpose and we can stop struggling all the time and 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 that we've uh, become who we're meant to be in the fullest sense. So if we look at that sense now, uh, if we look at that sense now, he says you might read it completely differently. He says this is not a blessing. For, uh, for each of the, uh, for each of the sons of Yaakov, this is a blessing for Shivte Yisrael for the tribes of Israel, and thus this is, uh, this is not about what each of them is meant to be. It's about what it will take for Am Yisrael for the Jewish people to become who they are meant to be, and you can see that it. Uh, alluded to in the uh, in the way in which the words in the wording of verse 1 49 verse 1 Yaakov called unto his sons and said gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which will befall you in the end of days Asher yikra eschem bachari sahimim and yikra is in the single in the singular form that is to say this is what is going to happen to you as an entity gathered together this is what's going to happen to you at the end of days. And then, of course, what's singular? A yikra. Instead of yikra'u, yikra eschem, that which will happen in the single form to you, plural. So there is one happening here. And that one happening is um, that one happening is to all of is to the Jewish Leave people. Leave me alone for a few minutes. Let me rest. I'm in pain. So that which will happen to um, 
that which that happening, that individual occurrence, which will happen to you at the end of days. And so he says this now, parenthetically, or or not parent. Oh, we'll get to it later. Uh, he then says, so th the entire blessing is meant. This entire uh, blessing to the Shivta Israel to the tribes of Israel is meant to is meant to orient us to the end of days. And so when he identifies the hierarchy of the of Shivta Israel, the tribes of Israel, in this framing, in this context, he's saying who he's saying who the uh, leader, who the Mashiach is going to come from, where is going to be the source of the redemption of Am Yisrael, of the Jewish people. And so therefore, he starts out with negativity for Ruvain and Shimon and Levi, the first three tribes, and then with um, and then with uh, with uh, encouraging words um, uh, and then encouraging words for um, <clears throat> And then encouraging words for Yehuda, who is going to be the ancestor of the Mashiach. And so in this sense, we describe, um, so, so that's why we understand why the negativity has to be pointed out. Because you would think that Ruvain should be the first, the firstborn should be the uh, ancestor of the Mashiach. He says, no, Ruvain, no, because he has this problem. And Shimon and Levi also know because he, they have this problem. And so they, they're not eligible to be the ancestor of the Mashiach. Yehuda will be the ancestor of Mashiach. And then he can go on and speak to the, each of the tasks of the other, of the other uh, tribes to indicate what their, what their task will be in life. But there isn't the need to repudiate them because uh, his purpose is done of identifying Yehuda as the ancestor of the Mashiach. And perhaps all of them are, are supporting, uh, supporting, have supporting roles in that work. Um, And that being said, so we understand that the whole, that this whole blessing, this whole, or the, all of these words of Yaakov are meant to orient us to the coming of the Mashiach towards uh, us reaching uh, our, that, that's, that blessed moment of redemption. Now, um, now we can return to Yaakov's words to his sons at the very beginning, in which he indicates that he's going to tell them that which will happen at the end of days. And if you read the verse, you see it's a non sequitur. He says, gather together and I will tell you that which will happen to you at the end of days. And then it falls flat and he says, assemble yourselves and listen, sons of Yaakov. So... So what happened there? Why did that verse, why did that, uh, why did those words fall flat? So Rashi says that Yaakov called to his children. And he said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. But uh, he, Yaakov, Rashi rather brings down a Midrashic teaching that says that Yaakov wanted to reveal the end of days to his sons, but the Shekhinah, left him at that moment. He had insight in that moment and his insight departed. And therefore he was unable to, uh, to tell his sons what he intended to. So what was he trying to do and why was he, why was he unsuccessful?
this is something that, that Jewish teachers and thinkers going back to the prophet Daniel have attempted to do, have attempted to speak about what is the day that we're hoping for. And what are we working towards? What, when, when will we get there? When will we get there? And uh, the prophet Daniel did it, Rambam did it, many others throughout the ages, the Chafetz Chaim. And Yaakov appears to be doing the same. So we can under, try and understand why is he doing that? Why does he want to tell us the end of days? Well, on the face of it, again, it helps us to orient ourselves toward the, um, it helps us to orient ourselves toward uh, where we are in the journey and uh, to give us a sense of hope and a sense of scale. But Yaakov attempting to do this is really not understandable because on the one hand, uh, to say, let's say Mashiach is coming today. Okay, what is today? The 11th of Tevet, 5781, 82, 82. The 11th of Tevet, 5782. So let's say Mashiach is coming today. So Yaakov is telling his children, you know, Mashiach is going to be here in another, in another 4,000 years. Mm. How's that going to go over? Disastrously. Right. They would be, they would lose, they would become, they would have such despair. So we can understand why it would be a bad idea for him to do so. But why is he attempting to do so, knowing what he knows? Why, what, we understand why he shouldn't, but why did he think he should? So there's another interpretation which says that actually, if you look in the Talmud uh, in Sanhedrin, the Talmud in Sanhedrin analyzes the verse, Ani Hashem bi'ito I, God, I, God he, the prophet Yeshayahu says that, uh, that the, the end of days will come. I am God. In its time, I will hasten it. So the Talmud asks, what do you mean in its time I will hasten it? Is Mashiach coming in its time? Is, is, it, is it coming on time or is it coming in a rush? So the, so the Gemara answers, well, there's two potential possibilities. Either Be'ita, Mashiach can come in its time. It can come in the normal, uh, in the, it, it can come as a, a normal process. Or if we earn it, it can come sooner. And so, um, and so then, therefore, Yaakov might have been telling his children, I am, I am Hashem. Uh, here, here, is what, here is what potential lies before you. Either you can, either you can work towards, either you can uh, wait for it, and then it's going to take 4,000 years, or you can work for it and you can bring it sooner. And this therefore, so that, that therefore would explain what Yaakov was thinking. He was thinking that he could, he was, he was thinking that he would be motivating his children by helping them understand what's at stake. If they don't work, if they don't invest themselves and um, if they don't really apply themselves to bringing Mashiach, this will take 4,000 years. But if they do, they can make it come sooner. So to let them know what's at stake. Now, the question remains, why is it that Hashem didn't want him? What is the message in Hashem not wanting Yaakov to reveal this really vital teaching? The answer is that in both cases, uh, whether it's the 4,000 year wait or the sons of Yaakov applying themselves to bring the Mashiach, it misses the point. And it, it shows uh, our fixating on that shows a fundamental uh, an under, uh, a perspective that needs to be corrected and adjusted. We have these legends and myths 
of the great tzaddikim who could have brought Mashiach. Oh, the story goes, if Moshe Rabbeinu had not hit the rock, or if the Jewish people had not, um, had not sinned with the golden calf, then Mashiach would have come, we would have gone into Eretz Yisrael and Mashiach would have come. Or the Arizal, story goes, the Arizal gathered his students together and he said, come, we're gonna to go to Yerushalayim and bring Mashiach. And one of the students said, I'm going to, um, I just need to tell my wife that I'm gonna be away for a couple of days. Arizal says, never mind, we missed the boat. The moment, the moment we, there was a moment and it passed. So you have these stories of the great tzaddikim, the great righteous sages who could have brought the Mashiach or tried to bring the Mashiach, etc. Who said that we missed the boat? The Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. But all of these are, are, um, are a perspective that are kind of someone else is bringing the Mashiach. Some righteous holy person is going to come and sweep me off my feet and is going to um, put me out of my misery in a good way. And, and that is the, that's kind of what a father wants for his children. A father wants to put them out of their misery. And Yaakov is the father of all of us, not to put us out of our misery. What's a better way of saying that? He wants to protect us from, he wants to protect us from the stress and the trouble. And he wants to, to make it possible for us to have comfort and to have uh, um, peace. Yeah, peace. Solace, serenity, yeah. safety. So that as a father, that's what Yaakov wants. And Yaakov is our father. And he would have wanted that his children, uh, Yehuda, or the Rabbi Shim, or Moshe Rabbeinu, or Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, or that Arizal, if the worst comes to worse, would would uh, take would or sweep sweet. us off our sweep us off our feet. Oh, I didn't get to you yet. <laughs> Wait, I'm coming there. I'm getting there. <laughs> that he would that he would that he would that they would come and sweep us off our feet and protect us and save us from this trouble called exile. But Hashem says, no, it's, it's admirable that you would want that as a parent, but that's not what I want as the creator. What I need is that every individual should discover Mashiach on their own. And for this, it doesn't help to get your children motivated to bring the Mashiach, to save all future generations from stress. I need each and every one of you, I need each and every one of, of Am Yisrael today on the 11th of Teves, 5782, to, to begin to turn their mind toward the Mashiach. Because Mashiach is not about somebody coming and sweeping us off our feet. That is the kind of redemption which was at the time of the exodus from Egypt, in which a great leader comes and sweeps us all off our feet and takes us all into the promised land, despite our inner flaws and failures. Mashiach, on the other hand, is about the ultimate maturing of the world and is about the, the actualizing of the potential of the Jewish people. And for this, no Jew can be left behind. Uh, it's, not, we, it's not that we have to be taken out of Golos, of exile. We have to be redeemed. We have to reach our fullest potential. And therefore, while, uh, while Yaakov begins by attempting to motivate his children to game the system, uh, to, to do what needs to be done and to, to, you know, to reveal an incredible amount of holiness, which would make exile disappear, that, that vision of that vision of enlightenment, which Yaakov was about to bestow upon his children, thus 
removing the gullus, removing, making the end, making the end of days visible, was taken away from him. And instead, he had to tell each of his children their path, who they are. And that means that each of us is going to work on ourselves. Each of us is going to work on our own individual character to make ourselves ready to receive the Mashiach, to make ourselves open, to make ourselves more spiritually enlightened. We have to, Mashiach is not about someone telling us the secrets. Mashiach is about each of us discovering the secrets. It's, it's different when someone tells it to you. You can, a parent can tell their child how to behave like an adult, but that doesn't equate maturity. There was a, what was it on Ellen? There was this kid, little Pentecost, kid from a Pentecostal preacher family, and he had memorized the Bible and he could get up there and he could preach fire and brimstone. Mm. But the kid had no idea what he was saying. He could he could say he could say a fire and brimstone sermon verbatim with all the knaches and all the uh, you know with all the inflections and he had learned the act to a T, but because he hadn't struggled with his own personal demons, his he had no it was not a real sermon even though it looked like one, and so Mashiach could be the same way we can have spiritual enlightenment. Uh, told to us so that we can kind of, uh, we can know the things, we can, we, can, uh, we can have the divine information that one would have at a time of redemption, at a time of spiritual fulfillment and enlightenment. But if we haven't discovered it, if we haven't come about it through struggle and through a seeking journey, then then it's just being aware of divine information. It isn't being redeemed. And so certainly as a parent, I can say there are times when I would like to just tell my kids what to do, but I have to, and I do. But ultimately, they won't know it until they figure it out on their own, until they go through the process of learning. Isn't that sort of what Moses did when his last speech? He also um, tells it like it is to the people, doesn't he? He does that to the Jewish people as a whole. Right. Interestingly, he blesses each of the 12 tribes. And there, there's no negativity. Right there, he blesses each of the 12 tribes also. So he bless, he criticizes criticizes them and blesses them. Um, if you look at the nature of the words, um, so um, th- look at the words uh, in verse one: "Gather, and I will tell you that which will happen to you in the end of days." Right. So gather means come close and listen to, and come close while I tell you a secret. But he says, gather and I will tell you. And then in the, in the, when he switches to plan B, as it were, he says, assemble and listen, sons of Yaakov. There's a difference. So while the gathering indicates a kind of unity, it is imposed by that which I will tell you. Whereas he kav tzu means to assemble, which isn't so united. It's just uh, an assembly, various people who stand in the same place. That's because each of them, the Bnei Yaakov, will listen. So in the first verse, the emphasis on who is doing the talking, the spiritual enlightenment of Yaakov will be revealed and expressed to them. In the second verse, they are going to have to assemble and listen 
They're going to have to turn on their thinking caps. They're going to have to pay attention. They're going to have to absorb the words that Yaakov is going to tell them. They're going to have to go through. They're going to have to process these words. They're going to have to go on a spiritual journey. And so this then, I think, is the, the teaching for all of us. The, the Baal Shem Tov tells a story. He says that, and he, wrote, he wrote, writes a letter to his brother-in-law. He says, it was the night of Rosh Hashanah. Was it 1647 of Kuzayim? 1637. No, okay, 1737. Anyway, a while ago. Yeah. It was the night of Rosh Hashanah, he said. And my soul ascended to the heavens. And I saw wondrous and amazing things which I had never seen before. And I found myself at the palace of the Mashiach. And there he was teaching Torah to all of the great sages, and they were happy to see me. I thought, am I going to die? And they said, no, we're just happy to see you. Baal Shem Tov says, I asked the Mashiach, when are you coming? And the Mashiach said, when your wellsprings will spread outward. That is the teachings of the, when your teachings will spread out, then I will come. And in this, in this, 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 these words, I think, are, are very powerful because Mashiach says, it's not about me coming. It's about the outside hearing the word. The, when the world, even the furthest, darkest, and most far out corners of the world, will discover Baal Shem Tov, what's that? Internalize. Will internalize. Thank you. Perfect. Will internalize, will discover and in internalize a Baal Shem Tov type thinking. Then I'll be there. Then I'll come. So, even the Baal Shem Tov couldn't bring Mashiach. All he could do was teach. But do the words spread chutza to the outside, far away? That requires the chutza. That requires the outside to receive it and to internalize it and to become enlightened. So, so it's, um, it's up to me. It's up to you, it's up to all, it's up to each of us to find our own enlightenment, to find our own relationship with Hashem, to find our own neshama, to find our soul. No one can bring Mashiach for me. Only I can bring Mashiach to the dark corner of the world that I inhabit. <laughs>